The question is that the motion be agreed. I give the call to the Honourable Kyle McGinn. Thank you, Acting President. I'll be re responding on behalf of the government. Um, and I look forward to uh, picking apart some absolute bizarre, bizarre speech, I have to say, um, by the Honourable Nick Garan. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the Honourable Dan Caddy for bringing the motion to the House, because uh, it is very relevant that we talk about this. Um, you know, as, as we... Sorry, what was that, Member? Order Giving members. the government response. Yes, and you know how this house works mm -hmm. at all? How about you take a bit of a note I, and, and learn a lesson here I'm, or two? I'm hey, how about you learn a lesson? Listening let's, with let's, interest. Let's see. Listening so, with interest. So the Honourable Dan Caddy, thank you very much for bringing the motion to the House. And it's very timely. Um, I, I, I didn't happen to see any Liberals uh, out supporting workers yesterday at the uh, aged care strike, or Nationals. I didn't see any of them out there supporting workers that have been underpaid, overworked, didn't see them down there supporting them at all. Didn't see any of your federal, federal colleagues. Didn't see the Honourable Ken Wyatt, who used to be the minister in that sector, down there doing anything to support workers that are underpaid by your federal government. Didn't see you down there at all. What I did see was a very diverse, hard-working workforce that took an unprecedented step on walking out of their workplace because the federal government has not listened to them at all. At least now we're talking about the real facts in this motion. The federal government failed to listen to these aged care workers. Failed. They didn't want to go out on strike. They wanted a pay increase. They deserved the pay increase. And instead, they get two one-off payments of $400 as a sugar hit so they can fill up their car for the couple of tanks of fuel. Not a real increase on wages. Disgraceful. And where was the Liberal National Party yesterday supporting workers of the aged care sector? Nowhere to be seen. Didn't see the Honourable Don Donna Farragher down there supporting them workers, talking so high and mighty about it two seconds ago. Where's the real boots on the ground? I didn't see one of your federal members supporting these workers talking about how they've dropped the ball for nearly 10 years. Disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. And, and, and you know, the Honourable Ken White is from WA. And what did he do whilst he was the aged care minister? Oh, that's right, crickets. Absolute crickets. It's, it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful that you've come into this place with that type of attitude, talking about how much you respect workers and all this sort of stuff, but you don't even... You don't get it. You don't get the facts. These workers have gone out because there is no other choice, because your government fails to listen. Why aren't you talking to your federal colleagues about how they can improve how they operate the aged care system? Instead, we come in here to twist points and try to get cheap political points from that side over there, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's absolutely what we're getting. That's absolutely what we get from the members opposite. Just cheap political grabs. That is all we get consistently, consistently from the opposition. So... Read the Oh, oh, absolutely, because it has to be, member. Because the federal government have done nothing. And what have you done? Have you written to your colleagues? Have you written to them and said, I am absolutely ashamed at how you've treated the aged care sector? I bet you haven't. I bet you haven't. I bet you haven't, member. I bet you haven't. So, look, the Commonwealth has full responsibility for aged care policy, funding and regulation. Let's, let's make that very clear. You know, the Honourable Nick Garan can talk off on as many prongs as he wants to, but let's be very clear. The Commonwealth Government have full responsibility on aged care policy, funding and regulation. The government, the WA Government, has been a strong advocate, strong advocate to the Commonwealth on investment in aged care. And that is evidenced by WA's 11 submissions to the Aged Care Royal Commission. Following consultation with the WA aged care sector, the state government's advocacy to the Commonwealth Government around the federal aged care budget, it has been focused on. Sustainable funding that covers the true costs and increasing complexity of care. Facilitating payment of competitive wages for aged care staff. We want to see real increases in wages in the aged care sector. That's something that the federal government should not be holding back on. We've, we've seen the cost of living be the biggest conversation point in the last two weeks. Where have we seen 
our, our seniors, our elders, who have, are being looked after, after being the people that have built the cities and the world that we live in today, we're saying that we're going to pay their workers that look after them less than we pay someone that waits staff in a bar. That is insulting. The stories I heard yesterday by attending the rally, and I really wish the opposition had showed up, because there were some heartbreakers. There were some absolute heartbreakers in respect. You know, one lady was telling me about how insulting it was to hear about the two $400 sugar hit one-off payments when they were looking for real wage increases. And they asked that of the Scott Morrison federal government, and what did they get? Nothing. They got nothing. So let's be very clear. The pressures that result in patients experiencing long stays in hospitals are complex and multifactual. However, shortcoming in the Commonwealth programs are key factors. And I want to explain a couple of things that have happened in Western Australia that have resulted because of how the federal government is handling the aged care sector. In the second half of 2021, the entire wings of the residential aged care facilities in the southwest were closed due to major workforce shortages. Meanwhile, older West Australians were stuck in regional hospital beds because there were no Commonwealth funded aged care beds. I'm pretty sure the Leader of the Opposition knows the southwest. And I hope, I hope that he was advocating the federal government to get off their ass and do something about it. Absolutely. Uh, I didn't hear him talking about it, though. I knew that was coming. Uh, Honourable Nick Grant, I, I of order. Off that comment. It's a, it's a slip of the tongue, and I no, apologise for that, Member. Um, in early 2022, a patient with complex um, barotric care needs waited approximately three months in a hospital bed after being accessed as medically ready for discharge, while hospital staff attempted to find aged care accommodation appropriate for the patient's needs. Around 50 separate aged care facilities were contacted in the search for this. Unbelievable. As at 4th of May 2022, there were 125 patients in Perth's Metropolitan Hospital uh, awaiting Commonwealth subsidised aged care services, with 55 waiting longer than 14 days. And I, and I touch back on what the Hon Honourable Donna Farragher uh, said in her speech. And uh, firstly, uh, I, would, I would absolutely acknowledge that you've gone through a personal experience in the health system, and I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and I understand... Um, how tough that can be, um, and uh, I feel for you and your family in, in that space. But well, it's, you, you did mention around um, beds and uh, availability. Well, we've seen here that there was 125 patients that could have been in aged care that weren't supposed to be in hospital beds, but the federal government isn't able to keep up to this stuff. They're not doing their job in the aged care space. It puts pressure on all other parts of the system. We really need a federal government to take responsibility, not just, not just be a marketer and sell used cars. It is just enough. It is enough is enough. These patients are assessed as medically ready to be discharged from hospital. So we're talking about 125 patients who were medically ready to leave hospital and vacate the bed to allow space for patients that need to be in hospital. So that's something that the federal government failed on miserably. And you know, it, it really, it really, really just the, the hypocrisy is just unbelievable. The state government has stepped in on numerous occasions to manage the impact of shortcomings in the Commonwealth funded services, in particular, the state is provider, a provider of the last resort in our hospitals and especially in regional and remote areas of WA. In country areas with no resident GPs, no resident GPs, and whose responsibility is GPs? The Honourable Steve Martin, you want to talk, tell me about that? Whose responsibilities is GPs? Whose responsibility is GPs? That's right, that's right. That'll be the federal government again, the Scott Morrison federal government, as per the motion that we're talking about. So, um, unbelievably, people often attend the emergency department at their public hospital with issues that do not require hospital care. The WA government has provided significant support to residential aged care sector to prepare for and manage COVID-19 outbreaks. Um, the Honourable Clara Andrich touched on um, uh, the first time in Australian history, the aged care strike. That's unbelievable. Um, 
And it, and it is full credit. I, I did take the time to read a uh, uh, media statement that was uh, from the United Workers Union on Monday uh, regarding the strike. Um, so just some statistics. Workers in six major providers with more than 130 facilities caring for 11,000 aged care residents will go on strike, well, went on strike yesterday in support of their claims for increased pay, staffing levels and walking off the job ahead of a major CBD rally. The, uh, the director for the United Workers Union, Carolyn Smith, says when aged care workers walk off the job, they are doing so because they feel they have no option but to take strike action. No option. Um, and well done to the union for supporting them workers, because without it, I, I don't know where they would be. Um, I want to touch on the Honourable Nick Duran, who's out on ur urgent parliamentary business. No, nope, sorry, mate, didn't see you there. Um, so, you know, constantly went on about not reading the elder abuse report, but if he uh, took the minute to have a think, he's actually commended me for talking on the elder, elder abuse report a few times in this chamber, because I have spoken on it many times. Um, and I find it quite amusing, because you did actually commend me for talking on that report, um, and now you're accusing me of not having read the report, which I find very bizarre, um, which I think is really interesting, Have Member. Have you read it? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Absolutely. And I spoke specifically on Aboriginal elders. If you remember, I spoke specifically on how it was hard for you to get data and information on elder abuse within Aboriginal communities. That's something that I find really, I'm very passionate about. And yes, I am the Parliamentary Secretary for Seniors and Ageing. And what I am currently under the way doing right now is the first ever senior strategy in WA's history. That's currently what I'm going around the state doing and meeting with seniors right across this state. I've been to Broome, Kununurra, Port Hedland, Karratha, Mandra. I'm going all the way around this state meeting with seniors in this state talking about what the next 10 years can be for seniors putting a plan in place so that we have a strategy, so that we can look after our seniors in this state, something the, other go the opposition doesn't understand. We take the time to get out there and consult and take input. We are facing an ageing population. That much is true. We currently have so many breakdowns in the aged care sector it is scary for seniors. And the Honourable Nick Garan touched on there is the independent elder uh, senior who lives uh, socially by themselves. This is something I've identified in the, in the strategy myself, is you've got a category of senior who still lives at home by themselves or with their partner and gets out and gets sociable as much as they can. Then you have the senior who's transitioned into in-home care and communities and et cetera and trying to break down the differences in need between them two seniors and putting in place a plan is what I'm currently doing. That's what I'm currently working on. And I'm working on trying to get engaged as much as possible our Aboriginal elders. Because I took seriously what I said in this chamber on that report around Aboriginal elders. And I found it shocking the lack of information that was in there, and I remember you got up and you told me that it was quite difficult, and if we went to the appendix of that report, there was a list that you actually contacted of Aboriginal organisations that didn't respond um, or couldn't get hold of in the, in the process. And that was, that was scary. To be honest, I, I thought we're talking about a very vulnerable part of our community. You know, to be a senior in the Aboriginal space, it's over 45. Over 45 is when you start being taken into account. Um, and, 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 and then once you see uh, the seniors at 65, um, you know, there's, there's a huge gap. And I really, uh, I really hope with the continued work that we're doing on this senior strategy, and, and I have to commend the seniors, when they come out, they come out in force, I'll tell you what, they come out and they talk about what they believe's going on. And a lot of it was, and I'll be honest with you, Honourable Nick Durant, a lot of it was around aged care's beds. 100% a lot of that was raised, particularly in Port Hedland. That was, that was really raised as there used to be federally funded beds that have now disappeared. And people want to live and die in their small town. And, and, and that is the challenge we face both from a state and a federal perspective, is how do we ensure that we have that level of care uh, in that place? Now, I also want to touch on, uh, in respect of the budget uh, from the Morrison government, 
Um, and a comment that I found quite interesting from Paul Sadler, Chief Executive Officer of Aged and Community Services Australia. And the Australian Aged Care Collaboration spokesperson says to the government strategy, misses the mark for aged care and describes it as a steady as she goes budget. Deeply disappointing in terms of workforce, the failure to address wages and aged care workers, how long is it going to take before a government actually gets around to getting justice for the workers, says Mr Sadler. From the point of view of the provider, organisations of ACSA and the AACC, we cannot compete in the broader marketplace for workers. We really run the risk of losing our current experienced workers to other areas that can pay better. And obviously we will struggle to recruit new staff if we can't be competitive from a wage point of view. The constant putting off the day governments is going to have to do this is really, really disappointing. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a strong government with a strong will and a strong mandate to fix the aged care sector. And I don't believe that that is going to be a Scott Morrison government, because they have shown under Tony Abbott, under uh, Malcolm Turnbull, sorry, I nearly forgot who that guy was, um, Malcolm Turnbull and now Scott Morrison um, <clears throat> and multiple um, aged care ministers, that they have no appetite to fix it. The Honourable Ken Wyatt, as I said earlier, did nothing. What did he do that is memorable in the aged care sector? I don't hear anyone yelling this out. Normally there's interjections galore, but this is, this is like, uh, this is unbelievable. Um, so I find it very interesting, very interesting. And I know the Honourable Nick Rand tried very hard not to talk about the Scott Morrison budget tried very hard not to talk directly to the motion because I feel that there may be some embarrassment in there. There may be a little bit of, oh, I'm not really impressed with my federal colleagues. He might, have, he might have even slipped up and said, don't vote for Ken White in the next election. Who knows? That's maybe why he avoided talking to it. it could have, I, I, honestly, you could, I could see the Honourable Nick Garan potentially voting for Tanya Lawrence. Yeah. I really could, to fix the aged care sector. I, I reckon that might actually have been the reason, the Honourable Nick Garan. Is there, is there a little bit of red inside that coat, maybe? I'm not 100% sure, but I find it very interesting that you found it very difficult to talk to the, to the exact motion that we were talking about right here. Um, it's very interesting. But, but look, you know, who's me to speculate? Um, you know, we, we, we will never know the truth. Only the Honourable Nick Garan will know who he votes for on the day. Um, but, uh, but if the Honourable Nick Garan um, was to look towards the motion that this House condemns the Morrison government for its failure to provide any support for the aged care sector in the recent federal budget, um, it would have been interesting to, see, to hear his views on what he thought the Honourable Ken White did in the aged care sector, what he thought the Scott Morrison government has done in the aged care sector, um, because I'm sure a lot like the contributions that we've heard around this chamber already, um, it would be absolutely nothing. Thank you.